Now, what is Paul doing here? First of all, I want you to see something. He is urging men. Men, listen to me. Preaching is more than just you doing a fine work of exegesis. Preaching is more than just you getting the grammar right and communicating truth. Preaching is more than that. Preaching is about life and death, heaven and hell. Preaching is not just the communicating of truth, but it is urging men. It is begging men. It is pleading with men to take the truth they have been given and to live according to that. Preaching is an extremely dangerous thing for both the preacher and the hearer. It is dangerous for the preacher because if he preaches another gospel, he stands condemned. If he commits a lesser crime and misinterprets the scripture, whatever he builds upon that bad interpretation will be burned on the day of judgment as wood, hay and stubble. So preaching is a dangerous thing for the preacher, but it's also a dangerous thing for the hearer. Every bit of truth that we are given for that truth, we are responsible. And so be cautious when you preach. Don't just lay that out there before men and say, this is the truth. But be like the Apostle Paul, who, although Apostle demonstrates here a prophetic and a pastoral heart, he urges them, he beseeches them, he pleads with them. Schaefer's question, how then shall we live? should be the question that you ask your people every time you give them a truth. How then shall we live? You will not be judged for the amount of truth in your head, you must tell them. But the amount of truth you have lived with your life. Sometimes I go and I hear men who boast to be great expository preachers and I feel as though I've just. I've just gone through a New Testament introduction. They've told me about history and how big the city of Colossae is and all sorts of things. But I need more than just background. I need to hear a voice within a voice. I need to hear preaching. And when I hear preaching, then I need to be urged to act upon it. In this day of eloquent men and tellers of jokes and men with whimsical personalities. We need men who have beheld their God. We need men who see the weighty matters of truth and scripture. And when they stand up before people, they can see eternity in that man's face. They know he is a man who more than being before people is always before God. The one thing that's so marked Elijah is that he was able to say the God before whom I stand. So when you preach, when you're going to tell someone truth or what they should do, you must plead with them to do it. We live in a society, a culture that is so superficial. That doesn't understand the weightier matters of eternity in life. The importance of a Godward life. And so when you come to them in the pulpit with truth, let them know this is serious. Do you realize that every time you preach, you are going to be to people a smell of death to some and a fragrance of life to others? This task that you have been given. You're not to be a comedian, a narrator. Or just a teller of stories. And you're not just to be a professor. You're to be a prophet. You are to plead. You are to beg men to align themselves with the will of God. And we can see this here. Paul says, I urge you, brethren. Sometimes if we're preaching on the streets, we may see the lost multitude before us and we might feel like Whitfield who told the crowd, if you will not weep for your own souls, then I will weep for them. But as pastors, we need to have the same attitude toward our own congregations. 
Paul is not talking here to lost rebels or reprobates. He's talking to believers. And he says, I urge you. I urge you. Some of the old men used to say things like this. Any conversation in which Christ is not the center of that conversation is folly. That can be taken to an extreme. But there's some sound advice in that. We live in a society that hears truth and, as the scriptures say, throws it behind their back. We live in a society that when, even when we meet together as the people of God, we're turned away so quickly in our fellowship from Christ to sports. We can hear a message preached that, that the scribes and kings and prophets longed for in the days of old. We can hear that message preached and rise up from our seats and then go talk about the weather. So when you preach, you need to communicate to people. This is a weighty matter that you must measure and you must live according to this truth that has been given you. Paul says, I urge you, brethren. Now, what is he urging them to do? He says, I urge you to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. I've been a Christian I've been a minister for almost 30 years. There are so many things that are so easy to give away. Give away a car, give away a home, give away a meal, give away 10. All that is outside the body. All that can be done while still keeping part of our heart away from God. What God is not just merely asking of you in a gentlemanly sort of fashion. He's not just asking of you. He is commanding you that you give him yourself in its entirety. One of the purposes of cultivating godliness is cultivating godwardness. That each day as we grow, our main occupation is to give more and more of ourselves away to him. That is one of the aspects of sanctification. It's not just not doing certain things and doing other things, but the whole idea is a matter of the heart. I want him to have every chamber. I want him to have freedom to abide in every place that he might be mine and I might be his, that my heart might totally belong to him. And if that is the case in the life of the preacher, everything else will fall in place. Everything else will fall in place. Now, notice here, very important for our culture, for our day. He says to offer yourselves to present yourselves. Now, this, this here is not, as the Greek scholars tell us, it's not present tense. He's not talking about the practice that has become so common in evangelicalism where believers come every Sunday and rededicate themselves over and over and over and over to God. This is a prophetic call. This is that prophetic word of how long will you limp between two opinions? If Baal is God, then serve him. If God is God, serve him. In the church, so many times, even in our preaching, even in our pastoral work, we seem to have become so tolerant that we give more preference to men and their feelings than we do to God. Now, we must be patient with all men as God is patient with all men. But every once in a while, the entire congregation and the individual needs to hear this for once and for all. Stop your limping between two opinions. They need to hear that word. They need to hear that call. This is not some lesser deity following men around as a servant. This is God. He demands, he deserves absolutely every part of us and our people need to know that. That God is not in this for them primarily. He's in it for him. For his own glory and to demonstrate his power. And any time the preacher or the people of God are not living according to his word. Rather than being for his glory through them. His name is blasphemed. Churches need to be warned. People need to be warned. Your activity not only reflects upon you. It reflects upon God. 
So if you are in the world, stop it. If you are living for yourself, cease and turn back to him in repentance and faith. Present yourself. Even for us. We need to hear this word. And some of you who are young need to realize that in your youth, you're being carried by zeal. And some of it even might seem spiritual, but some of it is just being excited about what's around you. And you need to know that when you get older and you get tired and bones hurt and the years pass, you're going to need more than youthful zeal to cause you to walk with him. It's the old prophet that strays so often. In his heart. And you're going to have to meet with this text at different times throughout your life. And you're going to need to hear this prophetic call. Stop it. Return to him. Offer him yourself. Some of you will probably experience great success in the ministry. Be careful. Men who experience great success, if they are not careful, often begin to see themselves as the spoiled rotten of God. That they can get away with things that other people cannot get away with. Because somehow they're treated differently. Also, they will stop going out to battle and begin to rest because they think they've won enough victories. And they'll tarry at home when they should be in battle. You need to hear this over and over in your life. You belong to him. And make sure that you are presenting yourself to him. Now, there's an interesting thing here also for our day. He says this, present your bodies. It seems strange. Present your bodies. What's being said? Well, at least in our day, it has a wonderful application. We are a people who have somehow divorced what's inside our hearts from our external actions. If you confront someone who is in sin, they will often say this. You can't judge a book by its cover. You confront someone in sin, they'll say, yes, you are observing my external actions, but you can't judge my heart. You don't know what's inside my heart. Paul has put this here as a remedy to this curse, to this type of thinking. The whole idea in the scripture is that if God has your heart, he has your body. There wasn't this separation in the scriptures. When he says, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. He's not trying to divide the human psyche. It's Hebrew thought of piling one term upon another. Why? To say, love the Lord your God with every fiber of your being. It's what's meant in the Old Testament warning that he is a jealous God. And he desires you. With jealousy. You belong to him. All of you. To all of him. It is not your life anymore. It is not your breath. It is not the beating of your heart. They're not your ears. They're not your eyes. They're not your lips. They're not your feet. They're not your hands. They all belong to him. And everything is to be governed by him. His nature and his desires that he has revealed in his written word. That was the Puritan genius. They sought to take every aspect of their life and do what with it? Conform it to the will of God. Because that's what slaves do. I see so many young Christians today, they've got their ears pierced or they've got tattoos on their necks and things like that, telling the whole world somehow they're a slave of Christ. Away with all your stupid external things. That tells me nothing about your position before God. But poverty of spirit, mourning over sin, rejoicing in him, glorying in Christ, making much of Christ to all those around you. That tells me if you're a slave, submitting to his will tells me you're a slave. Your actions tell me the content of your heart. You can study here. I'm not a flatterer. Anyone who knows me knows I'm not. But you'll not find a place where you'll be more gospelized than here. If you ever had a chance 
to be so mesmerized by Christ that you would turn yourself over him into entirely, it's here. It's here. And I'll tell you this, student. If you cannot run with footmen here, how are you going to run with the horses when you get out? If you can't be mesmerized with Christ to such an extent that you offer your life to him here, how are you going to do it when you're alone in the mission field or in that very tough pastorate? It's not just about getting a degree. It's about him getting you. About you belonging to him. Offer yourselves to him as a sacrifice. It's impossible to speak of sacrifice apart from speaking of loss. Of loss. Have you counted the cost? If you're truly going to walk with him, there will be great loss. There will be death to self. There are so many things that will have to be cut out of your life in order that the great things, the superior things might be engrafted into your life. Someone asked me to describe my own Christian life. I would go to Ezekiel 36. I would say that God took out my heart of stone that could not respond to divine stimuli. And in its place, he put a heart of flesh that can respond to divine stimuli. And then in the providence of God, he has taken me out of the land to put me in his land and that he has spent 30 years cleansing me from all my idolatry and my filthiness and it is costly. Offer your lives to him in their entirety. Cultivate that attitude so that as he reveals to you more and more of that which still belongs to you, you are ever willing to turn it over to him. Now, here's the question. From where does the motivation come to do this sort of thing? Because I have found that the obtaining of truth is not quite as difficult as living out the truth obtained. From where does the motivation come to live this, this radical, sacrificial life? unto God. And this is what I want to stay on most in the next few minutes that I have. He's telling them to give their life away as a living and a holy sacrifice. From where does the motivation come? Well, let's look. Verse one. Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice. What is the motivation? The mercies of God. What is the motivation for the Christian life? The mercies of God. Now, what does this mean? Well, that's why the preposition, therefore, is so important. Paul is linking this chapter with the chapters that precede it. What has he done in the chapters that precede? He's described to you the mercies of God. Now. Instead of just apply this to your life, I want to apply this to your preaching and to the people that the Lord may give you. You are constantly be you're constantly going to be telling them what they're supposed to do. But with that comes the urging and with that comes the responsibility to tell them how to do it. You tell your congregation, you need to love God more. Will your sermon be wrecked if someone stands up and says, yes, pastor, we fully agree. Could you tell us how? I mean, when you tell someone that they ought to love God more, they ought to offer themselves, be more willing to offer themselves as a living sacrifice. And they ask you, OK, I agree. I want that. I long for that. But I don't seem to find the power to do it. How are you going to respond? Well, Paul gives us the answer here. You know, if I was if I was laying on the ground here, I somehow passed out and I was in my work boots. I was at home and I was in my work boots. And you saw me laying on the floor and you walked by. And you saw me grabbing a hold of my bootstraps and pulling with all my might as I lay on the ground. And you asked, what on earth are you doing? Well, I'm trying to pull myself up by my bootstraps. 
and you pull out elementary physics and you show me how that is absolutely impossible. That I must be acted upon by some external force in order to pull me off the ground. I can't pull myself up. Well, how can you make yourself love God more? How can you make yourself more disposed to offering your life as a living sacrifice? The answer to that question is the primary task of the preacher. And what is that? The more the truly regenerate heart understands about the nature and works of God, specifically revealed in the person and cross work of Jesus Christ, the more their heart is going to be inflamed with love. Now, make no mistake. You present these things to an unregenerate heart and the more knowledge they hear, the more they will hate God. But those who are truly Christian, a supernatural work of the spirit has been done to them, a work that is far superior and demonstrates more power than the very creation of the world, because he created the world ex nihilo out of nothing. But when he converts a man, he takes a mass of rotten, corrupt humanity and turns it into a child of God. And that heart and that further work of providence ensures that the more that child learns about who God is and what God has done for them in Christ Jesus, the more their love will be drawn out of their heart. Their desires for Christ will be inflamed and those desires will have an impact upon their will and drive them to holiness with joy. So what is the main task of the preacher? What does Paul do in Romans 1 through 11? He labors with all his might to do what? Describe to the church in Rome and to us the mercies of God so that our hearts will be inflamed. Now, I want you to think about this for a moment. If I were to go into most even sound biblical evangelical churches and, and do a poll, and I were to ask each member, how many years have you studied the attributes of God? Most would say, well, I don't think we could talk in terms of years. I mean, what do you mean? Ask many pastors, how many years have you studied the attributes of God? Well, I, I had a, I mean, in my systematic for one semester, I had two weeks in which we. Are you beginning to see something of a problem? What is the greatest knowledge that the preacher can give to the people? The knowledge of God. I mean, after all, rich men are not supposed to boast in their wealth, strong men in their strength, or even wise men in their wisdom. And what are we to boast? That we know God, that we know who he is. One of the reasons why I would submit to you that even converted hearts seem to be so apathetic today is that there is a lack of the knowledge of God. We have become a principle based many times, an ethical based type of Christianity instead of the preacher standing up and proclaiming the power and the glory and the superiority of God and the great work he's done in Christ. That is your task. Tell people who God is. And that's what Paul does. And then what does he do? He goes on. And he tells them what man is apart from the mercies of God. You see, if I build, give Bill Gates a ham sandwich, he is not going to applaud. But if I go to many of the places in the third world where we work and I give someone half of that sandwich, they will kiss my hands. They will run through the neighborhood telling everyone about me. You see, in order to fully appreciate the nature, the person and the work of God on our behalf in Christ, we must understand what we were. One time a reporter came to me and he was so furious, a Christian reporter. He was furious. He said, why did you spend the whole night talking about the radical depravity of the human heart? And I said, because I want you to love God. You don't love God as you ought. Because you don't know how much you've been forgiven. Because no one ever told you how radically depraved you are. And so Paul labors for three chapters out of 16 in the closest thing we have to a systematic theology in order to set man up to learn to love and appreciate God. And then he goes through chapters four and five with this wonderful message of grace and salvation through faith. 
And then he gets into seven and eight and talks about how we can even in this life live victoriously. He gets nine, ten and eleven and talks about God's faithfulness to his to his people, Israel, that should promote in us confidence. He's the covenant keeping God. And then he comes here and says, based on everything I just showed you. Now offer your life as a living sacrifice. Same thing he does in Ephesians chapter four. That's the division of that book. Do you realize that first three chapters of Ephesians, in my opinion, the deepest theology and all the scriptures. And then he comes to four and he says, therefore. Therefore, what? Based on this. Live your life. Now, young men. I appreciate so much. All the resurgence of whatever you want to call it. A more reformed type of truth, more biblical truth, the resurgence of the Puritans, the early evangelicals. I so appreciate this. But young men, many young men who are learning these things are not understanding these things because they're marveling in these truths, but they're not realizing that these truths call them to lay aside all the wor worldly carnal means of doing Christianity and of planting and edifying churches. The more you truly know about the greatness and the power of God, the more you're going to lay aside all these silly ideas of church growth and church strategies and getting tattoos and wearing cool glasses and putting on dawning tight blue jeans. You're going to lay all that aside and you're going to realize that the kingdom of heaven is not built by little boys playing preacher because they're not willing to do the things that God has commanded in scripture, which is this your weapons of warfare. They are the proclamation of truth, intercessory, bone jarring prayer and sacrificial love. And if you want some other weapon, don't come talk to me about missions. All these other things are substitutes for what? For men not wanting to deny their flesh and take up the true armaments of God. Now, what kind of men should you be? I want to take you to a passage that is always ringing in my ears. Just hold your place in Romans, but I want you to go to Job for a moment. I'm going to describe to you what I hope will become your study room. I'm going to take you to what I hope is in time appropriate description of your library. Of the place where you open the word and the place where you bend your knee in prayer. This is the task at least illustrated of the true preacher, the true prophet. Verse chapter 28 of Job. Verse one. Surely there is a mine for silver in a place where they refine gold. Iron is taken from the dust and copper is smelted from rock. Man puts an end to darkness and to the farthest limits. He searches out the rock in gloom and deep shadow. Now, brothers, I do not want to enter into some Puritan type of maybe extreme metaphorical preaching. But I imagine this self, this passage at times is applying to me at 430 in the morning. Putting an end to darkness. Going into my study. Verse four, he sinks a shaft from habitation forgotten by foot. They hang and swing to and fro far from men. They are both alone and in a precarious position as they mine silver and gold. When I was first called into the ministry, my preacher, who was old school, he looked at me and this is what he said. He said, boy, can you be alone? And I thought he I thought he meant at first that if I preach the truth, other people won't like me and I'll be alone. That's not what he meant. What he meant was this. Well, all the other preacher boys are hanging out together, singing Kumbaya and playing games. 
Will you go be alone with God? Will you make his habitation your dwelling place where no one else can go? And son, it is precarious. It is dangerous. You swing to and fro. You're there before God Almighty studying his word that you might speak it forth to his people. A great mantle, a great stewardship has been laid upon you. Carry it out with the greatest of caution, the greatest of joy, but the greatest of caution. And he goes on, he says, five, the earth from it comes food and underneath it is turned up as fire. Its rocks are the source of sapphires and its dust contains gold. Alexander McLaren, the great preacher of, of the past, he used to say this about the scriptures. Even the dust of the book is gold. He goes on and he says. The path no bird of prey knows, nor has the falcon eye caught sight of it. The proud beast have not trodden it, nor has the fierce lion passed over it. He puts his hand on the flint. He overturns the mountains at the base. He hews out channels through the rock and his eyes see, sees anything precious. He dams up the streams from flowing and what is hidden he brings out to the light. Do you see how this applies to you? I know he's talking about those who are mining, but then Job goes on and makes the comparison with the wisdom of God who can know it. This is your marvelous task. This is your terrible task. This must be your magnificent obsession. That while everyone is warm in their bed, you're in the watch night. You're alone with God. You learn to speak his language. You learn to hear his word. As you study it, you go down into the mine where no proud man goes. You swing to and fro. It's dangerous because you get into the word. You see your own heart revealed. Skin back as a prey that's been hunted. And you learn. You become something more than just a man. You become God's man. More than just an expositor. But one who speaks forth God's word, it will cost you everything. And instead of spending your life trying to figure out every new strategy that comes from some PhD student that's never done ministry. Instead of doing that, get yourself in your study. Mind God, know God, so that when you come out into the pulpit and you open up your mouth, the word of God comes out. Now, in the last few minutes that I have, I want to say this. As I've walked around this campus and the other, I've heard many people talk about this. Students, wow, that guy has such an intellect. That guy is such a brilliant Greek scholar. That guy can so rightly divide absolutely everything. That guy is brilliant. I hear people talk about Spurgeon. I want you to know many people who've written biographies on Spurgeon. When they meet Spurgeon in heaven, he's going to be very put out with them. They talk about his mind, his photographic memory, his ability to just walk up and start preaching without any notes, without anything impromptu. Did you know what Spurgeon said? The prince of preachers. You listen to me, because if you do not learn this, all the other stuff you learn will not help you much. He said, I would rather teach one man to pray than teach 10 men to preach. Now, this came from one of the greatest of all preachers. When you finish your studies here. And again, let me iterate, not in flattery, but out of sincerity of heart. I do not think you could find a better place to study. But when you finish your studies here, do you think you finished? You haven't even started. What did you get here? All the knowledge of God. You didn't even reach the foothills of that Everest. You've studied the attributes of God in your systematic theology class. And I guess that makes you a man of God now. In law school, one of the things that they will tell you is we will not teach you law here. We will teach you how to find the law and how to apply it. Here you are here to do what? To learn how to study God's word and to learn how to proclaim it. And when you leave this place, what do you do? You start your journey. Taking all the tools that have been given to you now 
You live Job 28. What does this world need? We do not need more movers and shakers. We do not need more clever clever men. We do not need more strategies. There is more missionary activity on this planet right now than any time in the history of Christianity. And most of it is nothing more than smoke and mirrors. Because the task of the missionary is the same task of the pastor and vice versa. It is primarily to know God, to be before God, to study God's word, and then to go out and proclaim the word studied, to proclaim the God that is known. And this cannot be done just by the intellect. It must be done in the power of the Holy Spirit. Do not allow so many false prophets that exist today saying so many rude and blasphemous things against the Holy Spirit. Do not allow them to steal your inheritance. The only thing you can do, young man, of any good in the kingdom of heaven is by the power of the Holy Spirit. And you must be men and women of prayer. You must be. You must be. Jesus did not ask you. He did not suggest to you. That you pray at all times and not lose heart. He did not lay that down as a spiritual growth principle. He laid it down as a command. I beg you to cultivate a life of study. I beg you to cultivate a life of prayer. Do you not realize that all true men of God are broken? They're mosaics. They look like they've been strapped together and welded in different parts. They look like a stained glass window in which all the glass has been smashed and then patched back together. They are men who are broken by God because you see, here's the thing you've got to understand. God will work in your life to empty you, to break you, to show you that you can do absolutely nothing. Even in your brilliant expositions, you can do absolutely nothing unless the spirit of the living God is breathing through that place. It is the spirit of God. When Ezekiel prophesied in that valley of dried bones, it was the wind that gave life. What most fail to realize is that the spirit of God is most promised to work among God's ministers when they are lashed down to the gospel. When they are giving themselves wholly to just preaching the word. But never forget, you've done all your exegesis. You've studied every book. You've looked in every commentary. You see that you're orthodox. But if your knees are not scarred, do not come to my church. I do not want to submit my people to you. Young men come to me sometimes and they say, Brother Paul, I love the you preach so passionately and you say things like they are and you're not afraid of men. That's the kind of preacher I want to be. And I tell them, young man, lift up your pant leg. Lift up your pant leg. If I see no scars, don't you ever open your mouth that way. It must be tempered by the spirit of God. Oh, man, why play with Saul's armor? Why encumbered so foolish? You are prophets. You wear a mantle. You are called to search out the most superior things and then give them to the people who hear you. And you are called upon to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And none of that will happen unless you are a man of prayer. I praise God that I'm weaker than all of you. I praise God that I am more needy than all of you. I praise God that I can't even tie my shoes or find my own watch in the morning when I get up. It is in weakness. Your weakness is not your problem. The lack of recognizing your weakness is your problem. And when you find that weakness, do not allow the devil to turn your head and thus you become discouraged. But in that weakness, cling to Christ. 
I want to say this at the end. The man who is used of God is the man who clings tenaciously to grace, clings tenaciously to Christ. Now, in our culture, when I say that, many of you may be thinking, yes, these strong men with with self-will, these determined men who've caught a vision and and by, by their own strength, they're going to accomplish it. No, that's not what I'm talking about. Let me share with you something. You take the three biggest guys here, three biggest ones you've got, strongest. All of you can take me in. You three could probably take me in a fight. We'll all be leaving in an ambulance, but you could probably take me in a fight. (laughs) But let me say something. There's a way in which if I was only 90 pounds, I could kill all three of you. You say, how? Put me in the ocean. Without being able to swim. I've gone down twice. I have become a cauldron of strength. It is weakness. It is fear. It is knowing that if I do not grab a hold, I am going to die. And that let three of you men swim by. Even on surfboards, I will knock you off. I will grab you. I will drown all three. Because of my need, not because of my strength. Oh, I would pray that you would see your need. So that you would grab a hold of the person of God in Christ. That you would depend wholly upon his good spirit. That you would see your primary task. As mining out. The gold. Of the knowledge of God. And of presenting it to God's people. With scarred knees. What do we need in America? What do we need on the mission field? It's really simple. I take all the activity that I see today. Put it on a boat and ship it to an island where there are no people. Give me a man. Who spends the great portion of his morning. In the study of God's word on his knees in prayer and then going out from there every day and proclaiming what he has discovered in the power that he has discovered of preaching faithfully God's word. And ministering. With a sacrificial love. The darkness is out there that's out there is so terrifyingly great. If you ever look down the mouth of evil, it'll chew you up in a millisecond. You can do nothing against that. But in the power of the Holy Spirit, lashed to the word of God, proclaiming it in boldness and living in humility, every mountain can be lifted up and cast into the sea. Do not hide behind the sovereignty of God. It is the sovereignty of God that tells us the kingdom can advance. The nations can know. So catch that vision. And go. Let's pray. Father, I come before you. Use this time. For the glory of your name and the good of your people. In Jesus name. Amen.